open communication up as early as possible. Okay, that's good. So, but okay. is it is it a one time? Is it a one shot deal? And then you, uh, is it a one shot deal, or are you saying that you reconvene this group periodically through the whole process? Because we're talking about a two year process. So, right. I, I will tell you from the experiences that uh, various people have written about it over <coughs> in our building that the, the agencies can come, but they're not going to make any commitment. Mm -hmm. right. start. Right. Exactly. They're going to say, well, this is what we kind of expect, but you know, you're still going to run into all these contradictions mm -hmm. if you're not periodically checking in with them and if they're not sharing information. So do you, when you say formal pre-app, why isn't it a formal pre-app and app feedback system that goes periodically through the whole process? What's the argument against that? Well, okay. I think the rationale behind uh, this was an attempt at an a coordinated planning process. So because before you start the application, you have to do a lot of front work as far as planning what things you're going to prioritize in um, doing technical analysis on. So if you have an agreement on what those, um, those requirements are from the get-go, then the applicant actually has an easier time um, going through that pre-application period and completing the EIR and then eventually... No, granted, but the question I'm asking is, okay, yes, you get that value at the beginning of the process, whatever that might be, but then go back to your narrative earlier, a lot of the problems developed during the application process, not just because they didn't know what to do and how the process went, that was part of it, yes. But you had different expectations um, you know, from these agencies, some of them contradictory. Uh, you, you make changes for one agency and it can affect the evaluation by another agency, which is why they don't want to make a commitment right from the start. So that tells you that everybody has to be informed as it moves along the path, or you can get into <coughs> one of these situations where you make a change for one person and then, or one agency, and then the other agency says, no, that doesn't work. And the BCDC versus a fish and wildlife dispute is part of that. So I, I, I'm just wondering why you just think the formal free app alone is going to help the broader problem you talked about. Yeah, so um, one of the underlying issues that I mentioned was uh, roles and expectations. Mm -hmm. This is something we saw very, very clearly, the Water Board was the first to admit it, that these, these roles and expectations were just never defined at the beginning of the process. And um, I think it's their belief and it's our belief as well that it's because there was really never an opportunity to do so in the early stages of the process. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is throughout this case, it was always kind of sitting on a rocky foundation, a foundation that's right. established at the beginning. But do you think that's enough? That well, I Sorry, I really want to clarify this. Um, to answer your question, you're absolutely right, and that is what our system, our system does not intend to be a, a one it's not a one-stop, fix-it, like, checklist thing. Well, that gets to number two. So you see the checking in being done by the State Water Resources Control Board, not by all the agencies. So the way, um, I actually spoke to a member of the Army Corps of Engineers, and, and the way it works, and to specifically address some of the issues you raised, um, is that the Army Corps of Engineers informally deals with uh, the Water Board, and the Water Board sees itself as um, the coordinating body um, amongst fish and wildlife and other resources. So there's a lot of informal communication specifically made to make sure that when an application changes, there is communication amongst all the agencies so, so that um, a change is relayed to all the agencies so they know what the, the, the project looks like and you don't have this, um, you don't have a, a certain kind of application coming across in one agency and a certain kind of application coming across in the other agency. Um, and yeah, I mean. So you basically you're board. saying, let's make it clear to everybody that State Water Resources Control Board is going to be the coordinating agency for all the different entities that are involved in this permitting process. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? L largely, largely based off, well, based off this case, that was the role that the Water Board took, and that was, the, and the other agencies um, were content with that. So it is from from our understanding. Yeah, well, was the JPA thinking. content? And that, that was what do they the, say about the answer is no to that question, yeah. and that, that's one of the biggest. That was one of the biggest drivers of um, <coughs> the issues here. Right. And I, I hate to, you know, beat a dead horse, but the, it's roles and expectations, right? It's it's the JPA was not foreseeing, was not expecting the, the water board to take on that role, whereas the water board thought that, of course, this is going to be the role. It's going to make well, it's deeper than that. Everyone. 
it's deeper than that. It's about um, consultation through the process. So what happened is the Water Resources Control Board would often meet with the agencies but would not include the JPA in any discussion. So when the issues are discussed, you had to trust that the, um, that the State Water Resources Control Board was, didn't have an agenda. Now, whether they have an agenda or not, God, Lord, no, we can't tell. But, but we, as a political, a political design mechanism, we have to worry about the fact that they believe that there was an agenda. And how do you deal with that? Well, you deal with that by letting them be part of the discussion, or at least hearing the discussion, and not being, they felt like they were excluded from conversations that were being driven by the State Water Resources Control Board. So why wouldn't you, you know, why not take your pre app You've had open transparency to take care of all the expectations at the start. Why stop there? Why not say, okay, let's have some periodic check-ins where all of the agencies are there and they share their concerns simultaneously. Sure. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. I just think there was more informal communication um, in the kind of earlier stages, so this would just formalize and focus on that yeah. part. Right. Although, but if I can jump in a little bit, I think that also that uh, when, I, when I mentioned those very competing narratives, right, we tried to stay away from um, getting too much into the motivations aspect of it because the ability to factually, um, you know, essentially corroborate the JPA story versus the water board story was very difficult. Like we were very aware of that narrative from the JPA, right? But we really felt in a lot of ways, um, you know, uh, it came down to how do you build trust early in the process so those things don't start to then manifest later in the process. So even though it may seem as it's uh, playing out as if these are problems that are cons continuing to pop up and they are manifesting and, and kind of compounding. No, as I think the question you're asking is perfect, William. Really, uh, a right central one, which is how do you build trust in the process? Yeah. Um, and the question is can you do it with a one-shot meeting at the beginning or over a lengthy process does it take more? to build up trust. That's really the central question. Yeah. I don't want to have I, 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 I have answers, certainly the yeah. latter. Yeah. I think you, you struck it early. And also, I mean, just to go off what you just said in terms of competing narratives, in our discussion with the Water Board on Wednesday, they, they completely refuted, they were refuting the point, I think, when we brought up um, the fact that they had excluded the JPA when they met with wildlife agencies, and they showed us paper trails which, we, which you would get a different paper trail. Yes, which we'll get so a different yeah. We just and didn't want to get into any of that. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't, we so can't you, evaluate. Uh, uh, so make a decision about this. Right. When you think about normal, you know, I think about regulation in a different way, you know, like an electricity company that wants to go into the state PUC and get rates raised. Yeah. But there's a kind of a contention. Mm -hmm. And sure. you guys are sort of modeling this as, no, we're kind of trying to all go the same direction, but there's still got to be, there must be some contention in this process about, Somebody saying no, you need to do more, and the JPA is like, well, that's going to cost us more, mm -hmm. sure. right? There's there is contention in this, and it's sort of not it it it, it is still in this in this way of you know well are are they going to represent our interest in front of these other agencies? Well, maybe maybe not. And thinking about that, I think was was one thing. I I wanted to go a level up so I could understand Bruce's question, which is how often I I, I just have no idea of the magnitude of. How many times do they do this? You know, you sort of said they didn't understand the system, the JPA. Is it that there are thousands of applications, hundreds of applications, tens of applications that get to the water control, water board? And then uh, if there's a lot, why can't they hire the consultants who know what's going on as opposed to doing it themselves and being surprised by the process? I'd love to take this question. <laughs> um, sorry, because this is, um, the water board is unfortunately very understaffed. So for, um, I believe it's, 3.6 people that they have budgeted to do 401 certification process. It requires 7.0 staff worth of work. The Water Board received, I think, 265 401 certification applications last year. Um, they didn't have the capacity to go through all of them. And I think, the, so really what it boils down to, a lot of what you said, the other underlying issues that we sifted over, resource constraints, inherent, dis inherent conflict between the applicant and the regulator, are so critical. And there's unfortunately very little that we can do about that. So, so we, we're certainly limited in, in our practicum project in terms of the recommendations that we could propose. So we try to, to do the best that we can with what the Water Board has. And the Water Board doesn't have very much. And neither, neither does the JPA. The, the change from uh, PWA to HDR was only because the JPA couldn't afford um, PWA. And it wasn't a matter of 
them switching for any other reason other than that, from my understanding. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's a, it's a, more, it's a really important question that you mentioned. And I think that's something that we talked about with the water board and amongst ourselves also, is that it's then a tougher question to address how um, project applicants or permit applicants with a variety of resource constraints can get through this process successfully. Um, but obviously that's more difficult to think about. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned yeah. consultants, for example. I mean, we've mentioned consultants a lot, but m most people don't, a lot of people don't have the ability to, to afford expensive consultants. And then for those kinds of situations, then perhaps it's, it's policy alternatives that might cost more to the board, like technical guidelines or, a, or um, what's it called? No. Improved website no. and, yeah. and what, what was the last one? Portal. Yes, that really help um, people who, who haven't gone through the issue before and don't have the the means to, to go through um, mm -hmm. consultants. I mean, you, if the question is like, wh why don't we have a meeting every week or every day, or why don't we, why don't we talk, why don't we talk oh, really often? It kind of boils down to the fact that that, as Vian mentioned, the water board staff is just spread so thin. And if we if we have if we can scrounge up the resources to have a few meetings at any point in the process. Uh, we think that at the beginning of the process is really what's lacking the most. Um, okay. <laughs> when, you, when you say uh, you know, people without the resources, like JP, I think of like a a farmer who wants to do it. Is that? Exactly. I mean, that's that's, that's, really, that's, 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 yeah. that's yeah. more. Ninety percent. Ninety percent of the projects that, that the water board receives are these moment pop kind of projects. Yeah, and it and, is a problem. Yeah, I think. yeah no, I, 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 yeah. You said those are some of the toughest applicants to work with because. Yeah, similar things, they don't know what they're doing necessarily, they don't have the resources. Well, there are two other things that you didn't uh, talk about that were in there. Uh, one is, uh, right at the beginning, you were talking about the engagement of the board members. And that, uh, we did a big thing on, over in our building last mm -hmm. year on this. And so, one of the things that became very clear to everybody in the room, and we had mayors there, and we had the staff people, was that there was a disconnect between the board members and the staff that if you think the staff are stretched for time, you gotta realize that the board members have jobs. <laughs> and that this is just, and this is not just a problem for the State Water Resource Control Board. This really gets to the whole mechanism of a lot of what we do in the state as we put, whether you're talking about city councils or whatever, you put people that have limited amount of time and resources allegedly in charge of the policy, and then you have city managers or agents below it. And the disconnect, can sometimes be vast. And that was very much a theme in this. So when you, I'm just not sure that this, uh, how you get the engagement. There has to be some trigger mechanism, given the scarcity of time, that says there are some cases you pay attention to and not others. Right. So that's, I think that's what this policy is. Trying to do. That's what, so what is that trigger mechanism? Um, so as we go, as you we went through the process, we saw that you have this kind of uh, request for more information, which we saw as a normal part of a roughly year-long process. To, you submit an application and then they ask for more information. But then when we had the application eventually being uh, denied without prejudice because it had gotten to this point where the process was starting to break down, and so we wanted to have that be the trigger mechanism. So once the uh, project has actually been denied, um, also because the JPA was very vocal about their displeasure with the process, mm -hmm. but we imagined a similar um, process and had gone off the rails, but a um, less vocal and um, less uh, kind of like politically resourced body trying to go through the same thing, so having an automatic mechanism to then trigger and start to work towards this uh, conflict resolution. No, I agree with that, but here's the story. Just like you guys don't want to get involved in the mess, guess what the board members say, okay? Here's an executive director that you sort of trust and friendly. And everybody's accusing him of all kinds of dastardly things, some of which are no doubt exaggerated and some of which might be true. And you're, he, the board members are in the same position that you are. And how do I know this? Because I know Nusha. And I've talked to Nusha about it. And she did, I knew more facts about it, the case, than she did. Right. As okay. it started to evolve, because I was talking to somebody who had been a friend of mine at Berkeley who was uh, in the JPA, so I knew what was going on. But so the real problem, I mean, there's a mechanism here that's much deeper, a much deeper problem of how, you know, you have accountability when you have part-time people sitting on top of it. So I'm a little worried about that engagement ever really working because of, uh, of that. Now there's the third, the third thing, and I know I'm, I'm 
apologize for bringing this all up, but obviously I've been exercising about this for a while. No, for, I think it's fine. I mean, it's very, yeah. um, it, I think it's very beneficial for the students yeah. to get this input. So don't hold back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, now that you said that, he's <laughs> yeah. no, no. Okay. he okay. said that, you did. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy for him to say. <laughs> Get up on the kids. <laughs> uh, you just afraid he was holding back. <laughs> <laughs> so, a major element of this that sits out there with the public suspicion is the way the public comment part works. Okay, so NEPA and CEQA never really set out very explicitly what they're trying to achieve. It basically was you have to. Uh, you have to uh, investigate the environmental consequences of you know, federal, state, now local projects. You know. uh, and so it's a, it's a process. And so the idea was to make it a democratic process by having public comment period. But as you guys know, it's not your average citizen that shows up to do the comment. And you sort of suggested that in your discussion, that what you have, particularly in the Bay Area, is an abundance of nonprofit groups that have particular causes, all of which are legitimate, but all of which are things that are the most important thing in their life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's either Absolutely. wildlife or it's conservation, et cetera. And this is a leverage point, right? This is a leverage point because you can, by throwing objections and requiring the city to answer those objections, some of which got repeated over and over again, such as the levy on one side is two inches smaller than the other side, even though it was explained in, in several different times, uh, each time in the process, the same objections were coming out. So nobody has figured out how agencies should deal with public comment. Nobody has said, at what point do you stop answering public comment? You know, What's your, what was your reaction, what's your thinking about how that ought to be? Because that's very, very important. Because that's a lot of what caused expense to the JPA was they had to continually, people would say, well, okay, what's going to happen when the silt is released by Stanford behind the Searsville Dam? Okay. <laughs> you know, well, you know what, what's, so how do you deal with public comment that's being used um, to leverage particular viewpoint and to get part of the deal out of something. And where's the priority? Because let's at the end of this at the end of this river is a disadvantaged community that is living next to the creek because there aren't a lot of choices for people don't that don't have a lot of money. The people that are in East Palo Alto that are living next to that creek, next to that flood damage, they don't have a lot of housing choices. Okay? And so where is the priority? for flood protection, for a disadvantaged community, when all these other considerations are floating around? How do you make a decision if you don't say, there's this safety has to be number one? You know? Where's the, the, but there's nothing in the law, because each one of these laws were passed separately. And so you have an environmental justice issue, basically. You have a lot of upper middle class people that are rightly concerned about issues about wildlife and conservation, et cetera, but nobody's stopping to say, what's the first priority? What, you know, if we lose lives this winter because of a storm that comes floating down there, or we, you know, and $26 million worth of damage is going to be closer to $100 million worth of damages. And the fingers are going to be going all over the place, just as they did on Hurricane Sandy, and just as they did on, you know, all the other disasters. So how do you get priority into this process? About just to jump in, being a, uh, a native of East Palo Alto, I think one thing that's really used because really it's um, upper middle class people on both sides having the same kind of conversation. And the thing that's lost is that a lot of the land use issues were the um, power dynamic difference between the city of Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. So I think uh, we tried to stay a little bit out of the ideological aspect, but I think uh, this came out on both sides. There was this feeling of ideological superiority in terms of both. Um, Parties looking out for the community of East Palo Alto, when, uh, at least from my perspective, it seemed like that was more of a talking point on both sides to advance their own agenda. Except the East Palo Alto mayor um, was, I mean, his view was that he was being used by the, at least in our meeting, he said he was being used, he was tired of uh, environmental wildlife groups prioritizing that over the safety of his own constituents. 
Right? Just, it seems to me like one of the, to raise, like not raise it up even more than two inches on one side, but sort of, it seems like there was this about a, you know, using this case study as a process rather than getting deep into the details of this specific case. No, but I think it's, process is a, but process, process. Is, no, no, I disagree with you, Greg. I mean, I think this is, and precisely because I think the process is not just restricted to this case, okay? This, this problem is arising everywhere. And the reason that the governor, when he did his emergency proclamation on the drought, suspended CEQA, was that it, it's happening all over the state. We can't get a lot of the projects approved because the process is just too cumbersome. And so, and I think there's some good ideas in here. I think, you know, the online um, processing system, I think is going to be valuable. I think having the consultation, the pre app good idea. I'm just saying, is it enough to really move it along? And where's the measurables? Shouldn't we have measurables that say that there's some time period in which all this has to be done, given that we're talking about life and property that has to be protected? Okay. And we did raise the question of safety with the water board, and of course they said that that was one of their top priorities. Or well, they weren't, of course, going to say that. They weren't looking up. Well, <laughs> but, um, how big a priority can be if it's 2015? Well, well the then, line. yeah. Then you have the sort of competing narratives, and we've tried to stay away from he said, she said, and focus more on the things that we could see throughout the process um, that didn't really get at those more political or, like, moral issues. So I, I was questioning your, your, your categorization of a, a website as being a high cost. You know, can't, can't they get code for good to go and do the website for them and get it done? I don't know. Is it, how, you know we, we did spend a lot of money on a new website for Seifer, but it wasn't, you know, no, well, in the scheme of things, no, but in the scheme of things, it, it, was, it was under $100,000. I mean, I don't know, in the scheme of things, it seems like it's not a huge amount of money to have a website that would have, you know, sort of project-based stuff on it or whatever. I don't know. It, what, how did you come up with the idea that it was a high cost for something that could actually be transparent and let people know what's going on? You actually right. At first, we think we underestimated the cost, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but then what we realized is that as bad as the website is, it's very integrated. So it's not just their website; it's the website for the entire uh, state water resources. Uh, um, so all, all nine boards plus the state board are all integrated on the same system. Um, so one, the uh, the cost of then there's like a put. Well, this is actually a little bit. Of a yeah, you never agree on a website. Right. Kind of right. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> it's one of those things that from the outside, oh, like fix your website. I, I like we could probably code the website for them and make it a good looking website. But there's a difference between that and the integrated statewide system. Yeah. And all that. Mm -hmm. that said, that being said, the water board was very receptive to that idea, and they think that in the long run, it's a, it's a great idea because um, the cost the cost to the water board in terms of man hours when you're dealing with systems that could be fixed by a better website, they can recoup that like very quickly. And also, it's very useful when it comes to transparency issues and when um, you have stakeholders bringing up the same issue multiple times. Because you can have it all on a website, right. and, and once it's all on a website, you can, you, you can just say refer to the website because we've already dealt with this issue and we don't want, want you wasting you know, public outreach times and things like that. I'd like, you, I'd like you to say a little bit more about the client meeting. I heard it was an hour and 40 minutes. And um, as you've repeatedly said, you know, this was for the, um, the board. And how did, and you've mentioned they were excited about some of these recommendations. Did you feel like they thought they could really make progress on these issues with some of the recommendations? Or did you feel like they brought up things like Bruce Kane and said, well, you know, we really have to fix these larger things? I thought they were really um, receptive to, I, I think the thing, and I think Larry's going to agree with me when he talks about this a bit, but the thing that they really like um, honed in on is they're like, they're like, yeah, the expectations at the beginning are just, are just not set, they're not defined. And so they really latched on um, well, I think, to the, the pre-op feedback system. Um, and they, and they kind of grooved with that for a little bit. And I think part of the reason why the um, meeting took so long is because some of you bring this up and then they say, oh, and we could use it here, oh, and we can, maybe we can do this, and oh, we've got this series of M coming up, and how can this integrate into that, and a lot of stuff like that. Um, and I think they kind of riffed on multiple ideas. We were also in, uh, like surprised to see their willingness to uh, look seriously at alternatives that we thought would be more expensive. So they were very interested by the website, very interested by um, the online system. 
Um, and to us, we had the way we had framed it in our recommendations and methodology was that it's um, it's one of those criteria. It's like a li it's a prohibitive factor. So if we have a high cost, then we we won't really consider it for our recommendations. And they were definitely thinking along like the long term more than we thought, which was really quite like optimistic. It was refreshing. It was yeah. refreshing. <laughs> and, and I think to add on that, interestingly, they also I think that the percep they had a perception that our recommendations were skewed to more more on what they should do and what things that they could do, but then um, really not as strong as on addressing how the applicant can prepare themselves better for this. For instance, they latched on to the idea that the um, that the learning curve for the application is something that they thought was extremely important. They thought that the technical dis uh, technical disparities were extremely important because um, that perception, the, the, um, the applicant in this case, they had reached out to them um, in an attempt to start an early collaborative planning process and those um, initial attempts to reach out weren't met positively. So I think at some point we got to the thinking about how you incentivize that sort of collaborative approach because even though it seems like all of these problems pop up because there isn't as much meeting at the very beginning, it is also um, not just that the water board was not interested in doing this, but that um, in some ways it's costly to the applicant too to try to get into that integrative process going as, as the process goes as well. So I think we had a lot of interesting conversations around that. And to, I'm not sure, this is not necessarily even answering that question, but I think it's interesting because um, the water board themselves see their role in the process as quite integral, right? And, and that prioritizing of the environment is quite integral because it's easy to sort of put a price on property and not really think about all of these other environmental considerations. So um, their version of what a good project would be is that there is a way in which you could work with an applicant to come up with a project that still satisfies what they want to um, and also still meets environmental needs. And that to achieve that, it's important to actually not say that we are going to sort of shut down some of the environmental justice people and um, choose to, in some ways, prioritize um, people that are suffering in the here and now because the reality is that um, a lot of short-sighted interventions happen if you assume that there's a sort of prime good um, that tramps another because the, the the thing which is why this is so complex right it's that I'm, I'm trying to understand what you're saying you're saying the I'm not I'm not getting what you're getting at so oh no um with regard to is it, is it what I just said yeah just now? what you said I, oh, no, I mean I was talking about like whether it's you can actually put a quite a quantity in what's important, whether it's the environmentalist's agenda or it is the agenda of um, so you the think GPA. all goods are equally good. Is that what you're getting at? Or some 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 expenses aren't um, apparent to us in the short run, which is why it's important to spend a lot of time thinking about those other things. And this is not my perception per se, but I think it is uh, the perception of most some of the stakeholders <coughs> that we talk to in the process. Um, so I just wanted to sort of bring that up as a consideration that they might have had in thinking about some of these issues. They need to take on the policy one hundred four. The stakeholders do is what I was meaning. Not you, I didn't mean you guys. I meant the stakeholders don't think about these things. You guys know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, one other thing about uh, I mean, you brought up a lot how. You know, there, there were the, these two sides, and your client was the board, but you talked with a number of people, right, from the, the other side. Would you mention some of these, uh, would they make some recommendations? How do you think they would respond, you know, to these these recommendations? Yeah. yeah. So actually, um, the board oversight mechanism actually came sort of directly uh, from the JPA in a way, right, and really hearing uh, what they felt was a uh, move the process along. They really felt that... Um, once the board, even because I think precisely because the board members of the water board uh, didn't know as much of what was, what was going on, and just by bringing them into the process, uh, a lot of tangible and intangible, uh, there were a lot of tangible and intangible ways that the process really speeded along um, and started to work towards uh, a resolution. So I think that was a big one. Um, I don't know, you guys have any other? I was going to add also just that I think any of these can be interpreted by either side, sort of to what Zach is talking about. like the water board interpreted some of these issues of preparedness and all of that. Um, 
in saying that the JPA wasn't prepared, they didn't know what they were doing, and then of course then the JPA could say, oh, well, if you set roles and expectations early, then like we will be able to succeed, and then the water board will know like what they're doing. So I think any of them could sort of be interpreted. Um, we tried to kind of come up with neutral <laughs> arguments that will help the process overall. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I think there are a lot of good things here, so I'm, I'm just picking on the stuff that I would have liked to have seen or mm -hmm. whatever. And, mm -hmm. But I think what you have is really good. It's just that I think underneath it all, if you don't resolve some of these central issues, like how you prioritize, the di let's say you get a thousand different applications you got to do. If you can't prioritize the ones that are most important and expedite them, and you can't figure out which of these different goals are more important, you know, you, I, I think it's a mistake. And I don't think you can fix the institution until you fix that underlying problem. And, um, you know, so, I, I mean, the, I, I, it's, we're spending a lot of time uh, at the Lane Center actually studying the public review process in a lot of different contexts. And, I think that also has to be fixed, but I think that's beyond what you're doing. I just raise it as a problem. Um, I, I, but I think Mary's getting at something which is that I think the, if you're really going to, if you, the, the way to do this, and you don't, this is way beyond doing an undergraduate project, is to go back and forth with these recommendations. Uh, take the recommendations to uh, not just one user, but a bunch of users and see what they say. Because I, I think in the end there have to be some outcome measures, mm -hmm. how quickly you get it done, how satisfied people are, you know. Um, which ones you get done, I think, is also important. Yeah, which ones you get done when, you know, and uh, I'm not sure they really want to confront this, and I still am very bothered by, I mean, I think what you really mean to say is board member oversight mechanism, right? You want to get the members yes, that's engaged. Board directors. Yeah. Yeah. It should be board well, member, because I think it's ambiguous when you put it as okay. board oversight mechanism, mm -hmm. because you know, they'll, they'll say, well, yeah, our, our staff were totally engaged. Well, you know, and the other thing we heard <laughs> at this meeting was that even the executive director would often then, because he was so busy, delegate to a staff person. So it could be some person who might have a, an idiosyncratic bias that, um, that that's, that's you know, writing this, and it wasn't clear that the executive director said, okay, this is such an important case, I really need to, to hone in on that. So I think that this notion that there's got to be some trigger that forces the board members to pay attention and forces the executive director to say, no, I can't just take the staff member's re recommendation. i got to look at it much more carefully. I think it is an important recommendation. And maybe they will listen to that. I don't know. Let's see. It sounds like the reception to that idea is fairly positive. Um, and do you think they will actually do something about uh, fixing the website or the online, or is it, yeah, that's a good idea? And, well, uh, so we, we were kind of tiptoeing around our true feelings about the website, because, like, to be completely candid, we absolutely hated the website. It was just so, it was so <laughs> difficult. Oh, I agree with you. I've tried to use yeah, it, too. So did yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, so we were kind of tiptoeing around it when we got to the alternative, and, like, they, they started laughing. They're like, they're like, I do not understand that website. I, I cannot believe that that's our website. And you're like, okay, they get it. So, and, and, and that's 